I am a imaging project manager, but I'm more of a director of translational science would be the technical title uh, for several Alzheimer's research studies that involve neuroimaging in Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, which is a sort of Alzheimer's research. The most critical trials I work on um, would be the Diane studies, which are uh, focused on a uh, people that have a genetic mutation such that we know that um, not only that you're going to get the disease, but we can predict when you're going to get it with, uh, within one or two years. So I have a, a master's in computer science, and I happen to have a great mentor whose name is Mark Rakel, uh, who won the Kavli Prize in Medicine for default mode network studies or finding out that uh, ways of seeing how the brain talks to other areas of the brain. So he was really, really an early proponent of brain systems instead of just brain structures. And so anytime you Google functional connectivity or brain connectivity, his name is the first one that pops up. And he, is, uh, he hired me and um, I had uh, some computer programming experience and so I wrote uh, a bunch of tools that became sort of the standard. And eventually one day, uh, one of the people from the Knight ADRC Center said, hey, could I take on this, which was a very external multi-site collaboration study. And I said, sure, and then I just became responsible for putting these little platforms all over the world that could do Alzheimer's imaging uh, as far away as Japan, you know, Korea, and here in Europe, obviously. We have about 40 partner sites that I work with. The, the multi-site collaboration is a, is a huge deal, particularly in our study, but in Alzheimer's in general. So one of the attractive things about working where I work was figuring out a way, a mechanism to partner with these companies um, and, uh, and sort of provide a platform for them to test novel therapeutics. And that is one of the great things about working at WashU is because it allows you the freedom to sort of branch out and, and try these things and become like sort of a, because we uh, know how to do imaging in a unique way. As the population gets older, everyone's gonna get Alzheimer's. Um, yeah, I'm saying that kind of off the cuff, but that seems to be sort of true. Um, and so with these families in particular, what happens is uh, we can you know, run through lots of platforms or lots of tests and see if this is working, that isn't working. And so that's kind of where uh, I'm sitting right now is uh, in charge of the neuroimaging for those, those studies. But the problem is with imaging, data harmonization is crucial. So you have to have the scanners all standardized in the same way. So we have to like build these things out at the site. And that I'm talking MRI and PET scanners, but also how the data is acquired, the protocols. But on top of all of that, we have to have an API that allows us to assimilate all of this diverse imaging data and allow us to treat it in identical fashion so that we can say something about all these sites that we're collecting from. And then all of a sudden it becomes a problem, how do we get this data from these sites where it's imaged into sort of a cloud platform and then we can start using, and that also will accommodate our tools, um, and then we can start processing and do the analysis and ultimately say something about um, imaging in Alzheimer's. These sort of Platforms didn't exist until a few years ago, and now there are a few around, but very few do what we want. And it's, it's been very difficult. They don't change fast enough to accommodate new technology. They don't uh, host our own pipelines, our own homegrown tool toolkits. And so that's been, a, that's been a big issue for us. The ease for which these disparate sites all around the world uh, can get this data in, in, in a, what's the word I'm looking for, sort of a, the easiest way possible, like reducing the burden for these sites because you have these stressed out coordinators, technicians that are working in a hospital environment, they're already overworked and saying, hey, we need you to install this specialized software component on your computer and somehow you have to get your cranky IT guys to do it for you even though it's like a home built tool and there's no way they're gonna validate it is, um, has been really difficult for us. <laughs> so we need a seamless way of integrating the data from the site and that's uh, kind of what is put me on a mission to find something that can do that. And you know, maybe why I'm kind of sitting in this room today. We love the fact that you would take on our own pipelines, or our own tools and validate them and save us you know, hundreds of hours 
of, uh, of trying to get this, uh, the, the vendors we work with now all demand that we do this, but kind of offloading that responsibility and let us just get to the business of doing science is a huge, huge deal for us. What's really important and what the reason I'm here in Barcelona is to sort of help these other sites and these coordinators, these technicians, these, these neuroscientists um, figure out a way to get their data to us. And then it's always been an ongoing issue and it's always been sort of this, this hamster wheel of frustration. You know, just trying to get us the data and making sure it's labeled correctly, that everything is it's cleaned, um, it's ready to go and ready for us to take a look at is, uh, you know, sort of offloading that and having a platform that can do that for us also saves us thousands of hours, uh, literally, because we have a full-time person that does nothing but that and it's a constant, like, rejection, you must re-upload, this is wrong. Um, and it's, it's a cycle of complaint I'd like to get away from. Success on the level where I'm at um, would look like this sort of transparent flow of beautiful imaging data that was you know, sort of harmonized and standardized, coming unfiltered from everywhere in the world and in a easy to use, particularly with the site uploaders uh, manner and it can be processed. The sites that we're going to bring on board, the sites that aren't there yet, and you know, we're looking at ex further expansion in South America and China and, um, and other places where these families exist that were not yet there. And so being able to onboard those sites and have an easy to use interface to get the data to us uh, is a big deal too. Uh, there is so much, uh, this is from our current imaging vendor, there is so much paper-driven uh, instead of a digital platform to onboard these sites, which seems so antiquated and atavistic to me. I can't believe that this is still being done in 2022. And it becomes a source of frustration for these overworked sites that are functioning, you know, they're literally in hospitals um, by overworked people who don't have time to fill out these forms and understand even what they're filling out. And then to undergo this highly specialized training fee will use our imaging platform there's a whole middle layer that doesn't need to be there. It should be just really horizontal. It should be someone on my team saying, okay, we've got these people at this site. They are now the designated official, you know, Diane people that are going to upload these scans. And we've just opened up the channel for them to do it. From the time that I'm told that there's going to be a new site, to the time we get the scanner certified, the data uploaded and the people trained at site can be as much as long as two years. And that's, that should be silly, it should be two weeks. Every partner site has to install, and I, I hit on this at the beginning, has to install a specialized piece of software in order to be able to upload uh, to this imaging vendor. We will upload uh, pet phantom scans from the various sites as well. And he, they undergo a similar review process. And in a lot of ways, these are more complex because we have to acquire the data without any smoothing uh, with the correct number of uh, iterations and uh, and a lot of times the site is just too busy to really think about it or install a Diane specific protocol and they just use whatever they use for the human scan that day. On top of all that we have to train the uploaders, the people that are uploading the participant scans and that is an issue because there are so many ways to screw that up and it's always mislabeling it or always not checking correctly for PHI uh, that these scans are continually getting deleted and they're, they don't have the power to delete them themselves. They have to be unlocked, permission has to be given to delete, they have to find time to delete the scan. And, uh, and then the new scan is hopefully correctly labeled and reloaded. And what we'll see from that is we see a lot more failure from the human interface aspect. And what we need is a way uh, that they can only select one label. There's only one way to upload it. And the PHI is cleaned at the cloud level in a way that the person uploading doesn't have to worry about it, right? They know, unless it's gone through some weird anonymization process at the scanner source, uh, that once it gets there, the data is safe, is protected, there's no identifiers, 
and um, that they only have to do the job one time and instead of three times or four times or you know uh, it's, it's, it's you know there are scans we've been trying to upload for two months and it's just uh, it's a nightmare particularly with MRI machines uh, then the outputs change the fields change with every upgrade uh, manufacturers will add private fields or they'll change where a field is located and so hopefully the images get better, right? That's for why you upgrade the software, right? You decrease the noise, increase the resolution. There's a new, you know, super head coil that's come out that does imaging at a subvoxel level, which is everyone's sort of dream because finally we can image a hippocampus or something, which is crucial in Alzheimer's. And it's a tiny little thing. We don't have an effective way of processing them in the cloud. We can download all these things and process them. But you know what it would be hugely valuable for us and the person that's supposed to be processing them don't have enough bandwidth to sit back or hire people to say, this is going to be your full-time job and we're going to write papers about this. If we had this pipeline built into the cloud so my team could process it in real time, the data was there, then I could say something about it, or one of my team could say something about it, or I could hand it to a postdoc or a graduate student and they could write about it. And then it would get out there and more people could do something with this data. Uh, having that commonality or that tool on a platform would be a really big deal for us. And all the results that are reported from the Diane studies, all the papers that are written that use neuroimaging to correlate with other biomarkers, that's all from our pipelines. We need a platform where that's hosted, and it's upgradable by us, because as new tracers are developed, new tau tracers come online, for us to change this on another platform and get it incorporated, it's a huge change order, and it takes a year or more to get it done. Uh, we need the ability to integrate or ma you make those changes ourselves, and then have the validation ready to go and say, okay, this is, this is done. It, it, it should be a matter of weeks and not a year. And it's, it's Again, that's, that's a big deal. The biggest thing in the next few years we're going to see is going to be some resolution. Instead of millimeter resolution, we'll be seeing sub-voxel, sub-millimeter resolution in these 12T and 7T scanners that are coming out. And as these become more dispersed at sites, we're not going to see it for, you know, we've, we've got 7Ts at various hospitals now in the United States. I'm not sure if they do in Barcelona, but the images coming off these MRI scanners are incredible, but they're also huge. There's a lot of information in there, and you're going to have to figure out a way to sort of archive these things, store them, and also move them around. We have several, several imaging protocols in the Diane study that are experimental. They're not primary outcome, but they say so much about what be what could be the underlying incidents or what are the root causes of the disease, like vascular injury. So looking at white matter um, uh, degradation or white matter disease, which is not something any Alzheimer's study is focused on in neuroimaging right now, but vascular injury is turning out to be a huge thing and a huge component of dementia. And probably, because of that, a huge component of Alzheimer's. In imaging, we can go in and say, well, this is what it means. This is where these plaques are. This is where these tangles are starting. And as imaging gets higher and higher resolution and sharper and sharper, we'll be able to see it at the very beginning, and not when it's like you know been there a month or a year. Uh, we'll be able to see when it, it occurs at a subcortical level uh, in the tiniest areas of the brain, like the hippocampus or the hypothalamus. And so that's really important. And that's why imaging will always be hugely important in Alzheimer's research, or just cognitive research in general, right? It's because you can look at real-time changes. <laughs> so the way that we do imaging is going to change dramatically, but man, yeah, it's, you can't not do imaging. I mean, that is, it, especially, you can look at real-time changes. You can look at blood oxygen level deployment. You can't do that with uh, a blood test, right? You can look at how the brain is metabolizing glucose, for example, um, you know, in real time, and say, you know, hey, look, this is this is a, a really big difference, you know, because certain parts of the brain aren't suddenly using glucose anymore. What's going on? They look intact, but they're not. You know, things have changed there. If you just do a blood draw, you're not going to be able to see that. But yeah, imaging is always going to be the biggest aspect of like just not all, all Alzheimer's research, but any type of cognitive research. It's going to be like the biggest thing.